Well, you've caught me right in the middle of getting rigged up for a boat trip. I do enjoy my boat fishing. I'm using my regular boat gear, sort of 20, 30 pound outfit, lever drag reel, a shark line, which is 50 pound, which does pretty well anything swimming around the UK. I'm gonna land on that. Running ledger, there's the lead runs up and down. A bead, so that the knot here doesn't bash into the um, boom itself. That's a the theory behind it. I'm not really bothered about it, but everybody puts beads on, so I might as well be the same. A swivel, then I've got a long flowing trace here. This one is, oh, it's a span that's at least six feet long. Halfway along, I've got a long snood or dropper. You can see that there, quite a long one. About 15 inches, regular hook, and then right at the end, obviously, say another three feet, a hook. Now, the reason being behind that is Sometimes you want to fish two baits, not through being greedy, but because you have two different types of baits. Now you could be having, let's say, mackerel and squid, standard on the south coast pretty well for a lot of you guys boat fishing. Now, most of the time you don't know what squid smells of, unless, yes right, unless you leave it in the car, forget about it for three days in the sunshine, and then by golly, you know it smells. But generally, when you get fresh squid out of the packet, I can smell it, I, I can't really smell anything. But mackerel smells fishy, there's blood coming out of it, so with that blood coming out of it, I figure if I have it on the uptide, any smell going down that way is going to attract a fish to either the mackerel or the squid at the end. Now, final tip, big tides, fast tides, I'd fish with just, say that, 18 inches, a short, call it a length, a tail, whatever you want to call it, a trace, to the first hook. I wouldn't be using two hooks like this, I just have a single hook and nail it on the on the seabed, because the bulk of our sea fish are on the seabed. Because we have, say, medium range tides, and that would be from between spring tides and small tides, which is the neap tides, where there's less water movement, less current strength, less tide strength, I like to go for a longer trace. It gives it a little bit more movement in the tide, spaces it out, and therefore you can use two baits. It's nice, I don't do this all the time, you know, just occasionally I, I fancy putting two different types of baits on. But I tell you what is nice when you go fishing and you finally bang into a fish and you know what, you go, by golly, I don't know what the hell I have hooked. I had a day like this out with Wayne. Check the fish out. And it appeared that the rod just bent and bent and as I wound and pumped, it just got heavier and heavier. Now I thought, obviously, conger. Wayne's getting the net ready. We're not still sure between the two of us. Wayne's thinking it, it might be a cod because it's hanging deep and they get a sort of nod nod fight they get to it, you know, when you get when you get a big cod. And this struck me as being a really, really good fish. I've had striped marlin on this blank, so I know exactly uh, how hard uh, I can I can pull on it. And this was one of those days when we both had been just fishing and fishing and fishing and we didn't exactly know what it was. The fish got closer. My nerves got more frayed. No doubt Wayne's nerves got more frayed because it's his boat I'm on. But eventually, when we get it up near the surface, we could see it was indeed a Kajunkin great big C-O-D. A cash on delivery, yes, a cod, a target species for a winter's day. Hence the net. Wayne is straight in there because he knows the flavour a cod can be and he is a first class cook, he knows how to cook them, he knows how to net them. In the net, my beauty, there's one place you're going, not Wayne the fish, and it's a frying pan. Well, I don't know what you get at that fish, it's the first time I've used Mike's camera here. Well, hopefully you've got a bit of action, got a huge fight in it and Wayne kept calling it a cod all the way saying it's coming up uh, coming up very, very deep. So lucky, and that was on some Weymouth squid. We'll get Wayne to hold him up for you and uh, take a look at it, but we figure it's uh, high teens towards 20, but probably looks about 18. So well pleased, took a, a nice piece of uh, a nice piece of squid. Can be good scrap too. Yeah, we're gonna go 17s, 17s to 18s maybe. Uh, I'll live it, it's a good, dub, good, good decent double. Yeah. Well, uh, it's Graham's call, I'm holding up by the way. Don't normally hold up other people's fish, but yeah, he's filming. But uh, what a lovely fish this is. I think he's gotta be gotta be 18. Who knows? He's gonna be close to that. It's a very, very nice fish, very light in colour. 
Um, stay deep and you're fine with cod. When you get a bite, if it's a ray or a conger, they tend to kite up with the tide and go right back behind the boat. This stayed deep, which made me think it was a cod all day long. And um, took a nice big piece of squid bait, big baits. Um, people you catch big fish on small baits, we know this, but the problem with, uh, oh, here we go, there we go. There we go, he's on, he's on, he's on, on the camera. I'm pulling drag. Oh, and he's off, on and off, is he? Yeah, Where's he's he going? on and off, yep. Good pull down that one, yeah, way, yeah. There's not a lot you can do about that other than just leave that back down. He was actually taking line off the reel that time, yeah. wasn't he? Well, there's not a lot actually. People say I'll oh, give them line, give them time. If he's taking it away like that, I tend to sort of lean into it and see if he's on. But so, what's that other bait you got there, Wayne? Different type of squid. Just show, show us those. Yeah, this is uh, an unwashed squid at the moment. Um, a bit bigger than your normal uh, calamari. It's got that sort of grey tint to it. It's full of guts and stuff. You open it up and it's full of that brown uh, mustardy substance inside them, which uh, people call custard. And you fish those whole, would you mean? Yeah, you fish them whole, fish a head, fish, fish a head, like really, depending on what you're fishing for. But um, it's a decent bait, it does get bites. Uh, and as I say at the moment, we're a little bit stuffed with bait, aren't we? Because um, the price of calamari is high. Um, there's not a lot, of, it's been a very poor season for cuttle. So we've, uh, can't pick up the cuttle. And cuttle's expensive as well. So I mean, it's getting to the stage where it's costing you more for bait than it is for fuel, which is a bit of a shame, but it's the way of the world, isn't it? Well, we had another bite after Wayne had that uh, fish we lost just now. And he called this one right again, small conger. On the old Weymouth squid again. Let's get him in. I think I'll take this lead off because I don't need to be clouted around the head with that. Put it in my pocket. <laughs> Only a strap, but listen. It's a fish on a nice mild winter's day and there's a chance of something else as well. I feel there could be something big coming today, Wayne. Let's hope so. Let's tee bar the kitty off. Hold on. <laughs> tee bar the microphone off as well. It'll take that, uh, <laughs> it'll take that um, GoPro with me, my boys. There he goes. The best bit about that is I got my squid back. <laughs> Pounds worth of squid, that is. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely and tough. Well, just uh, got a whole squid. Wayne's got what the body and stuff you're going to cut up there, Wayne. I'm going to put the head on. I'll just show you in the water with the big tentacles. And you may be able to see that one down there. I've got a bit of the guts, the head, and you can see the big long catching tentacles on the squid there. How do you catch their prey? And I'm going to leave that at the back. Now, of course, small fish can peck away at that. But I'm hoping that a big fish is going to eat the lot. So let's drop this one down. Well here we've got Graham's lovely cod that he caught earlier. Um, I'm going to take the fillet off on the boat. Now, personally, I don't eat the belly fillet and Graham's not that fussed either. So we're going to leave this cod intact and take the fillet off while it's gutted. Nothing goes to waste, by the way. In case anyone says, oh, what a terrible waste, there's a liver in there that could be used and, and roe, potentially. Um, that belly flap, for instance. Nothing will get wasted. What's left will all go in the old rubby bin and uh, that hopefully will go towards catching us a nice big fresher shark in the summer. So nothing at all will be wasted on this fish. Okay, so this is basically how uh, I take the fillets off a of fish like this. It's a nice sized fish, this one, as you can see. As you can feel there, he's pectoral fin. He's got a bit of a lump there. Well, that's uh, just where his pectoral joins into his body there. Now, there's a lot of meat behind the head here. So what I tend to do is make a cut just behind the head, like so. And you go in there like, like that and I'll turn that around slightly and go down in there. Now I can feel that I've just got that bone there. I just need to just crack through that bit. There we go. So now I'm through there like so. There's his backbone there. I want to just go literally just this side of the backbone and the fins. And I don't want to go in too deep. I just want to start the cut there and I just want to just carry that cut, literally just as you can see this side of the fin. So there you go, so we're going to go along, just inside, not too deep, just down inside. Get to about, just past the vent, there's the vent there. 
and I'll put the knife in, I can feel the backbone there. I just want to go just over the backbone. I feel I'm just over the top of the backbone there. And you can see the knife will come out. And if you stay close to that backbone, all the way along, taking the meat off. There's the backbone there that I said I'll stay close to. Now it's just a case of trimming, keeping the knife angled down. You can hear it rattle against the bones. And as you trim like so, you just lift that fillet clean off. So basically what you want to do there is just, you can feel the bones, feel yourself go against those bones. And then you lift that fillet up and away from all those bones. When you get to here, you have to angle it back in again because there's quite a bit of meat around that bit. If you go straight, you will leave a little bit of the meat on there. But what I'll do is I'll take the, flip this fillet off. Let's like say, look, you can see the bones there? Listen to the knife. They're the bones you want to stay real close to. If you stay close to and gently lift that fillet, you'll lift that whole fillet off. You can see it coming up now, look. And as I say, when you get to the, about that point there, you want to angle that back in because there's a lot of meat there. Anyway, we'll lift this fillet off and I'll show you where we are. So as you can say, see here, lifting it, lifting it. Now because we don't eat the belly flap, we'll lift all that meat up along those rib bones. And you'll get so far and the bones stop. So when they stop there, you just cut the skin lift in all the time, cut, cut, and lift that fillet clean off. And it'll come off and it should be relatively boneless. Well, you've seen the size of that cob. My God, you should see the size of the fillets I got from them. Well, I didn't. Wayne did. They are really chunky fillets. Look at the size of those. But Wayne tells me the best way to do this is in beer batter. And the secret is to put a little bit of flour, just regular flour, into a bowl and just dust them lightly first. Now, I've I've dried them off with a paper towel and I'm going to put these chunky fillets, my god this to feed the 5,000, into the flour and apparently that helps when you do the batter, when you put the batter, we're going to make the batter up as well. And what we've got to do is get that batter stick into it and you want it to act as a seal, you do not want to move it around, says Wayne, do not move it, he knows I'm a real messer for moving stuff around. So I'm going to put some flour on these two just gigantic fillets. I've left the skin on these as well because what they do tell me is the skin can be actually good as well, nice and crispy to eat. So there we are, I've just dusted those lightly. Next, we're going to make up the beer batter. Right, to make that beer batter, I've got my flour in there. It's better to go with too much and too little, put quite a bit of flour in there. And I'm going to add to that a little bit of pepper, don't need much. Salt if you want some, and then Look, I'm just using a log. I'll put my hand over it so there's no advertising. But the secret is, is to get the consistency right with this. And you don't want it too thick, and you don't want it too thin. You want those fish fillets, as big as they are, to actually stick to the fillets. So it's best, like ground bacon with fishing. Look, if you put too much in, you can't take it out, can you? It's better to just make it up and add bits to it gradually. And what happens is, I think it's the, the bubbles in the beer like lager, you can use whatever beer you want of course, that does actually make that batter nice and crispy. Get it to the consistency of something like, sort of gloss paint is what you want really. I think a bit of working, but we shall get there. I'm using egg whisk, a bit old fashioned, I know it's a bit old fashioned, but it actually does work. A lot of these old school cookery programs do actually work. If you uh, you can see that is now getting to the consistency of the gloss paint. I wouldn't want to be painting my bedroom with it though. What I'm using there is a saucepan full of regular sunflower oil. Now you can use this again, you can use it over and over again, but just make sure that you use this just for fish. You don't want to cook it again and have your chips in it or anything else. Just keep that for fish. Let's get it on the gas. The other thing you can do, centralise your pan on the gas so you get maximum heat. And if you put the lid on, that will actually boost the heat and you'll get that oil cooking quicker. And for those who don't know, a lot of modern saucepans have different vents here. You can see the curved pouring lip there. 
if you put those holes by the vent that allows any excess steam to come out different sizes small holes there hopefully you can see that larger holes on that side and obviously when you're cooking fish make sure you put your extractor on Now I'm assured a good way to test the oil is put a little piece of bread in there and there we go, it's bubbling away. I feel that's hot enough. Right, we've got the batter there, let's get the fish in ready. Give it a good covering of that thick batter and get it into the oil. Now this is a gargantuan piece of cod there. I'm going to lower it in slowly. It doesn't stick to the bottom of the pan. Be very careful. I haven't moved that at all. You can see that's just starting to go gold. I'm just hoping I can get both those huge fillets out of the pan in one piece. And there we go, lovely piece of golden, deep fried cod there, in beer batter, sautéed potatoes there, and for me, the healthy one the wife's given me, some green peas. Only one thing to add, some tartar sauce, and obviously, the obligatory glass of wine. Mm -hmm.